Tom. Hey, man. How are you? Good. How are you? Yeah, good. I'm good, thanks. Good. Thanks for doing this. No, my pleasure. Thanks for the invite, mate. Thank yeah. you. What's up? Say it again. Sorry. What time is it over there? It's noon. How's it noon? Oh, okay. I'm Los Angeles, yeah. Yeah, so how's the quarantine going? What have you been up to? Yeah, it's going. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite fortunate, really. You know, I'm at home with my family. It's I've spent much more time with my daughter um, than I ever have. So I'm just trying to, to, to keep focused, keep some sort of routine, you know, make sure I get up at the same time, make sure I just keep exercising. And I'm just, I'm really getting in, into, um, we're, we're, today we've been making a train set in the back garden. Uh, and so just doing all those little things that you don't really get to do when you're full-time at work and when she's full-time at nursery. Yeah. So yeah, I'm doing. You said it's, I've been doing a few train set. Yeah, like a little toy train set that you know nice. normally I wouldn't have the time to do. So with my daughter, we're uh, we're playing because she would normally be at nursery. I would normally be at work. So nice. I'm uh, becoming a bit of a kid again. I think uh, that's great. I mean, there definitely are some things to take advantage of with this. Time yeah, like that. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been doing a couple of live education things for for Davines, obviously. Uh, and just working on a few collection and show concepts, just just trying to use the time as much as possible as I can, really. What have you been doing? Um, the same. Honestly, this has given me a lot of time to work on projects I've wanted to do for Lost Hairdressers. So, yeah. so that's been good. Um, actually, doing hair is kind of at a standstill right now, so just yeah. trying to stay healthy physically, mentally, you know, um, my wife and I have been married for about a year now, but you don't really get a lot of like this much one-on-one -on -one time. So it's, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's a bit yeah. of an exercise. It's been good though. I mean, it's kind of feels like it's good for the marriage. <laughs> yeah. I never thought I'd be excited about going and putting the bins out or something like that. Because you get oh out. man, seriously, any, any excuse to leave has been crazy. And then, Except for this past few days, LA has been super sunny and clear and clean. Oh, really? The airplanes aren't as much and the cars aren't as much, so the air is beautiful. Yeah. It just makes you want to be outside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. nice. I think there is cool. There are all the difficult things that everyone's going through. There is those nice things as well on the other side of it. Totally, totally. So how old is your daughter? Nearly two. To, okay, cool. Wow, it's a nice time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's good. It's good. I'm enjoying spending some time with her. I think it'll be nice when she goes back to nursery as well. Though, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at a two-year-old. Oh, I can't imagine. Um, yeah, well, yeah. for the audience, um, Tom and I have at least been kind of in communication for the past few years. Tom's been uh, really supportive of Los Hairdressers, and we've. Uh, you know, posted his stuff. And I've, I've really loved Tom because I think it was always hard for me to put uh, my love for haircutting uh, together with my love for editorial work. And yes. I think Tom has done a really great job at kind of melding these two things together. And I want to get a bit more into like the mentality of that. Uh, but also maybe just start with something you've told a thousand times, but kind of how you got into this industry. Um, I, I got into the industry with, through my parents had a salon. So uh, my mum and dad had a salon when I was really little. So I was running around the salon from the age of three, two years old. Uh, so I've never, I can't remember a time when hairdressing really wasn't in my life. So... Um, it, it was it was a, a kind of a natural progression that when I finished school, or when I, even when I was at school, I started to work at the salon to get some extra pocket money. And um, from there, when I was about 16, my dad took me to watch a Trevor Sorby show. And I saw Trevor on stage doing his one-man show. Uh, and then when I saw that, I was like, okay, I want to go and do that. But if I'm going to do this, I want to do what he's doing. Sure. I want to go and explore this other creative side of the job that I didn't necessarily know existed. I'd seen 
the, the as far as my dad's salon, which was a great salon and he was a really high level hairdresser. But um, I hadn't seen the whole shoots and shows and creative side. I didn't know that existed. So when I saw Trevor on stage, that that really got my attention. Yeah, absolutely. Did um, was your dad was his education with Trevor Sorby? No, no, it wasn't. He, he's, he was educated in the north, uh, north of England, near Manchester, where I'm from, a town called Wigan. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he was a very, very passionate hairdresser, and really, really focused. And so I, I, I always think I had like the best start I could have had because, you know, you know, when some dads are telling the, telling the kids about, I don't know, Maradona, Pele, my dad was telling me about Trevor Sorby and Vidal Sassoon. So it was, um, it, it, it was the best start I could have got, really. Sure. We were talking about how, how people tend to rebel against what they um, mm. were raised with, you know, raised around. So sorry about that. Yeah. If you could start over a little bit. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't uh, necessarily rebel, but I didn't, I didn't have a, an interest in, in the, the hair aspect of hairdressing right away. I, I enjoyed more the atmosphere of the salon, you know, people who were... Uh, it, it was a cooler, older crowd that worked in the salon. You got to wear nice clothes. You got to maybe go to the pub with an older crowd that you wouldn't have got to hang out with if you, if you didn't work with them. So I liked that social aspect. Um, and then it wasn't really until I saw um, the Trevor Sorby thing where it really grabbed me and I thought, right, I'm going to go 100, 100 mile an hour into this. Yeah, absolutely. What? How is – I have an idea of it, but um... – in Europe, how do you feel hairdressing is looked at differently than, than say, in the United States? Do you, do you feel a difference there? Uh, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I, th I think there's people, that, that there's, there's hairdressing that people are, are aware of, say, let's call it the creative or editorial or fashion side in the US and in Europe, and there's people that aren't aware of it, and, and they kind of... Have the and the salons are more of a business to, to to you know put food on the table and pay the bills and I think I think that exists everywhere. Maybe in the past there was more of a divide, um, but right. I, I would say you know there's 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 high level hairdressers everywhere now, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, social media has helped with that concept a lot. Um, I think when I decided I was going to do hair, I could tell my parents hesitated a minute like to be supportive of that there was like a you know did they like almost have, like what did they do sorry. what did they do uh, my dad worked in um like film and video stuff like that and then my mom was in the dentistry field and i just feel like sometimes in the states it can be looked at at least back then as kind of like a dropout career or a good enough yeah. career you know mm. where in in europe i feel people can be brought up in it and apprentice start apprenticing at a young age. It, it always felt a little more respected. Like when I would go work in, oh, really? in, uh, in London and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's, who knows? It's a very difficult job, but it's a really great career. And I think there's a Absolutely. very, if you do it just as a job, there's easier ways to go and make money because it isn't an easy thing to do. You know, you sit up standing behind a chair and it's physical and you, um, so if you, I, I always think, say to it, people coming into the industry if, you, if it's just a job to you maybe have a look for something else you know because sure it's absolutely very rare that you'll be successful at hairdressing if it isn't more than just a job yep for sure mm. so so from that point you go to the trevor sorby show did you kind of immediately try to go work with them or what was the process from there um so no, at that age, at that time, I was only about 15. So, um, and he didn't have a salon in the north of England. So I was a bit too young to move to London. So uh, I joined a company called Andrew College. Prominent hairdresser in the UK. He's, he's won British hairdresser in the year a couple of times. Um, and he had a big salon group in the north and they were opening uh, a new salon in Manchester. So I went to, left my dad's salon to go there to become an assistant because I wanted a, a taste of a company that had an artistic team and did shows and did photographic work. Uh, and that training at Andrews, that's what that gave sure. me. And uh, I, uh, I, I'd read in a magazine how difficult it was to get a job at Trevor's, um, the Vardering process, the entrance test. Um, so I didn't want to try until I felt like I had a good, a good shot at 
passing that test. So. Right. So the process for getting into Trevor Sorbet, did you go and interview and have to perform some haircuts or, or yeah. what was that like? So, so I, you have to, um, I, basically I sent my CV and my, with a cover letter every week for 12 weeks, every Monday morning, the same letter got posted. And eventually they called me up and just said, okay, stop sending these letters. You can come for a, a chat. So I came down, had an informal interview, and then they invited me to sit a trade test where you have to do five haircuts. Um, and I did the first haircut and the lady that checked the haircut used more sections to check it than I'd used to cut it, which ain't a good sign, as you know. <laughs> um, and I sure. ended up failing the test. Um, so I didn't pass my first trade test with, with Trevor and I had to go away. And that was a very long train journey back up to the north where that was my goal from being for so many years and I just failed at it. So uh, I, set, I set my sights on, I was disappointed, but I, I was so excited as well because I came out of that place and I'd held that salon in Covent Garden on, on such a pedestal in my mind that it almost, if it was anything less than that, I would have been disappointed. So I was disappointed, but I, I was excited that I'd failed because it was so much better than, where I, the, than the level that I was at at the time. So sure. I, set, I worked for another year uh, I, I went and bought a soon ABC and uh, just worked and, and developed and uh, the thing I'd done wrong on the actual training, test, I just worked on those techniques and then I went back a year later and then passed a year later. So they, are they looking for you to cut hair the way Trevor cuts hair? Like, cause they have their own system. So yeah. are they looking for you to already know it basically? So no, so in the, they have, so the way it works is you do um, you do five haircuts, and then if you pass those five haircuts, then what they're looking for is that they can get you to pass your final test with Trevor. So if you pass those haircuts, you have to start vardering for five, six weeks, between four and six weeks, depending on your level. And then if you, at the end of that, you have to present 11 haircuts to Trevor, and it's like a present presentation evening, the whole salon shuts early to watch. And he goes around and he checks every haircut to make sure the balance and the shape and the suitability of the model is, is all correct. Um, wow. So that, in that test, that's what they're looking for. They, want, they don't want to ask you to leave your job if they don't think you've got a good enough chance of passing the final test. Because then, you know, you've, you've, you've got to leave your job without a guarantee of another job. Because if you fail the final test, you, you six weeks, uh, you know, you, it's, you have to leave. So um, they looked at my first bit of work and they were obviously felt I didn't have a good enough chance of passing the final test. So, sure, yeah. sure. Man, amazing. Yeah, it's pretty rare for, um, it's pretty rare for a hairdresser, especially when they've doing, been doing hair for a while to put themselves under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do think it's really helpful. I think that um, when I moved out to LA, I had to, uh, I started working for Benjamin Salon out here and, and having done hair for 10 plus years at that point, and then having somebody go through my haircut, like I was yeah. a student again. I mean, it was humbling and, uh, and I definitely had to sharpen up a bit and I didn't realize that I, that I needed to before that. So it was good. Yeah, I think it's, it, I mean, and, and not very often in your career uh, you, do you get the opportunity to take a step back because, you, you know, you, you get in, you do your clients, you maybe you've got all these projects going on, so you're just going, aren't you, doing, doing, doing each day and day out. So it's valuable to have that time to, to take a step back and get let someone else look at your work and, you know, eradicate those bad habits that, you know, we all pick up, don't we? Absolutely. Um, so... Obviously, you got on with Trevor. Everything was good from that point. Um, how yeah. did you kind of escalate from there to, to becoming the um, art director? Um, so with Trevor, <coughs> it, it's obviously a company that there's been many people there for many years, and it's a company that holds on to its staff so well um, because of the opportunities it provides. And um, I've, I felt like if I was going to get Trevor's attention, um, to eventually achieve my aim of joining the artistic team, etc., then I was going to have to like show him what show him what I could do. 
So I set, um, I, I created a, a photographic collection um, and then I hired a theatre um, and put on my own show. So um, called The Beginning and it, uh, it was a theatre in Chelsea and I invited the whole company, Trevor obviously, some, some trade press and uh, I put on a hair show with no idea of what I was doing. Um, nice. But it went well. And we shot a film for it and I, I felt like I could do, I wanted to get out what was in my head uh, and I felt like if I could do that I would get his attention and from that I, I got his attention. So it, the, the show went really well, he was really happy with it. Um, and then the week afterwards, he asked me to set up a young artistic team mm -hmm. and to set up a young artistic team. So that's where I got my first opportunity was to, was uh, I set up a, a young art team and mentored them. And then he was happy with the way that I mentored them. So that when, when it was time to choose a new art director, because Angelo had left, um, he, he, uh, he gave me the opportunity. So, um, Two things. How long ago was that when you put on that performance? That was 2013. 13. Okay. And so, what yeah. was what was the theme? Um, so the theme was basically, I shot a collection um, of just ideas that I had in my head for a while, but I didn't really have the um, skills to execute them. And obviously, going through my vardering and learning all these new ways of graduating and texturizing and things, I could finally do them. So I worked with a photographer, um, got the images, and then I wanted to find a way to present them. And I wanted to find a way to, 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 inter, to weave like video, and, and then we shot a video. And the idea for the video was, it was basically a model. Um, you saw a lady in a video and she made her way backstage. Like the beginning, have you seen the film Goodfellas? Mm -hmm. When he's walking in the kitchen and going into the, the nightclub. It was a right. one take, uh, there was no edits in it, it was just one take of a girl walking through a backstage of a theatre. And then as she reached the stage door, she pushed open the stage door and the, the film cut to black, but then the model walked out on stage. So it was as if the audience had just watched her make her way to stage in real time. And yeah, it, it, it went well and uh, it, it's, it was the first step on, on the ladder, I think. So, um... So for me, my start with hair, um, and I know people are not here to hear about my start with hair, but so I can relate to you, uh, yeah. was with Tony and Guy. Oh, yeah. And that was um, early 2000s. And uh, this time in hair was very much about, uh, you know, very kind of disheveled uh, mm -hmm. haircutting, lots of flat ironing, stuff like that. And that was kind of like the heyday of, of my era coming up. Especially the the nucleus of my education. Yeah. Um, I'm grateful to have had them as part of uh, my my journey for hair. One problem was that the people who could style very well, kind of all they already knew how. So they they had that, and then they brought it in. Um, whereas right. the, the styling really wasn't pushed at least at that point in their education. So my question to you is, had you, had you been training and styling with your parents like long before that? Had you always had a leaning towards that? Um, what is it? I've, I've been training in cutting and styling or, or dressing hair. The, the dressing hair part of it, which I think uh, sometimes get, gets lost within people's education. Yeah, no, I've, I've always been more um, focused on cutting because I've always enjoyed cutting more. But then as my ideas have developed, I found that that was holding me back a lot. Um, I'd have, and especially over the last few years, I've been exploring combining her cutting and her dressing in, in the same image. Um, sure. And I started to feel that the, 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 the dressing skills were holding me back. So that's something that I've had to, to work on. Uh, where the cutting came a little bit more, uh, I wouldn't say naturally, but I was I had, a na I had more of a natural interest in it, and you obviously you, you put more effort into the thing that you have more of a natural interest in. Don't you? So. Yeah, I can I can definitely relate to that. Was there someone who kind of mentored you more fully into the hairdressing side of things? 
Um, I'd, I wouldn't say it was a particular person, but everyone at Trevor Sorby, or most people at Trevor Sorby, have, uh, have a strong dressing uh, skills because it, I suppose it comes from Trevor having worked at John Frieda and Fidel Sassoon and Tony and Guy and done session work. So he brought all those different things. He brought that Mayfair Leonard type of hairdressing to the Sassoon technique of cutting and he created that alloy that's Trevor Sorby. So there was always people that had a great uh, dressing pedigree there. So there, there was, you didn't have to look very far if you needed to see something. Sure, that's great. Um, I think, you know, with what you've been doing lately, it really speaks to both crafts really nicely. I mean, in a way that I, I don't know that I've seen much. And oddly, maybe the only person I could reference um, commented on your on your uh, post that we did today was is Guido. I see I see a lot of haircutting in his work as well. Um, so how I don't know like how was he a big influence or how did you meld these two together successfully? Let's go with that one actually. Um, it, it came from wanting. I never, I never want to like repeat myself or do something that I've seen before. So if I've seen in, in my photographic, in my personal photographic work I'm talking about here, so if I'm producing like a collection of images that I'm paying for that's my own kind of comment, um, then I never want to do anything that I've seen before and I never want to repeat myself. So that's, that's kind of the, 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 the first stipulation. And then when I was figuring this stuff out, So many different types of haircuts, and there's so many different types of uh, dre uh, dressing techniques. So, in a time when everyone's thinking, is everything being done in hairdressing, or, or um, how can we find new ideas? How can we find new photographic ideas? When you put those two things together that haven't really been explored together, there's infinite amount of combinations. So mm -hmm. then I. There's a, a chef um, that has a restaurant in Chicago called Alinea. Uh, mm -hmm. And I saw a documentary with him it's called Grant. And he does a thing called flavor bouncing, where he will, draw, he will write different ingredients down and then bounce them off each other and, and draw lines across them to make these combinations up. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So with the, the, the combination of dressing and, and, and cutting, I... Um, I took a big board and I wrote down every haircut I could think of on one side from shaved head, graduation, layers, short layer, all the way down. And then every dressing I could think of from ponytail, French pleat, vertical roll, uh, scalp plait, all down one side. And then just drew lines across. And then on the bottom I wrote down like different texture, textures like wet, dry, frizzy, straight, curly, wavy, uh, through the top and then across the Across the top of the board, I, I wrote all different colours, so maybe like you know, obviously copper, red, beige, cream, and then I just started to draw lines on these boards mm. to see. And I'd say probably eighty percent of the lines that you draw, the combinations you, you make, don't work. But every now and again, you'll get one that works. And one of the ones was the graduation with the French pleat, and one of the images that I, that I did. Um, and when when I drew that line, I was like, okay, that could work and then I started to experiment with that so man that's beautiful um that's a uh, that is really good insight to a process uh I think that world the, the world of hairdressing and the world of, of culinary uh, skills, there's a lot of commonalities there. And mm -hmm. uh, I love that process. It's really cool to think about. Um, what were there some, or give me an example of something that really didn't work. Didn't work. I uh, put yeah. to shave. So I put like, oh, sorry. I, I put like a shaved head, number one, number two, number three, question mark. And then I had ponytail and I drew, drew it and I was like, ah, does that gonna work? And then I, I got a head block and I did it. And it looked like, did you ever see the old uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme film, Kickboxer? And yeah. the bad guy, 
had a bald head with a ponytail. And I was like, it just yeah. reminded me of the villain in that film. So I was like, I just can't, I can't do that. That's <laughs> what <I've been. laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it's a classic film, for sure. That didn't uh, work. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's that's really great. Um, I think that what you came up with worked really well. I I imagine that you had to find a model that was maybe already intending to get their hair cut short or something like that in order to yeah. find the right person. Yeah, I, I don't like using wigs or, or wefts or extensions. Um, I always want to... To, that, that's the challenge, I think, and this is not, I'm not saying anything about anyone that does, because people do fantastic work with, with, with wigs. Sure. And, but just me personally, m I feel like my challenge uh, is, what can I do with that piece of material that grows out of someone's scalp? So I feel like the second that I have to add something, I've almost been defeated, because mm -hmm. I've not achieved what I wanted to achieve, which is to do something inventive with that thing that grows out of their scalp. And it takes me a long time to cast the right girls because I always feel like that, that it's not just about the hair type and the bone structure, it's about the character of the girl and it, has she got the right personality to carry this off? Um, sure. you know, is the haircut gonna be wearing her or, or is she gonna wear the haircut? And that's yeah. a, a very different thing. So when I'm casting the girls, they're predominantly street casted uh, so I'll have a conversation with them and try and assess whether then it's less about the character and that, and the, the personality of the person that's wearing it is a, is a big part of it. So. Sure, sure, um, very good. So let's see here. So, did, did many of the models keep there? There's such extremes and lengths in, mm -hmm. in the work. Yeah, so what I would do, because <clears throat> some of them are quite conceptual, right? So some of them, you know, there was one where it was a bob and there was a ponytail left in the middle. Now that's, that's more for me as an image where I want to get that shot. So then what I would do is I will show them this is how your hair is going to look straight after the shoot and I maybe show them like a stronger bob shape or something like that. Um, so then I get my bit of it, and then yeah. they get there. They've got to be able to wear the, the end bit, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I can't. absolutely. Well, the last thing that I would ever want to do, and I pride myself in keeping great relationships with the girls that I use, um, is that if I say something is going to look like something at the end, it absolutely has to look like that at the end. And that's why I'll use a lot of the same girls repeatedly. Um, because they know that if I say something, then, then they're going to get that. I'm not going to say I'm cutting a fringe here and then it ends up here. Sure. Uh, and uh, that's so I, I work with a lot of the same girls, really. And if they need a haircut, they come to me and I might say, okay, I've got an idea, so let me just trim it because in six months' time, I want to do this idea. And they, you yeah. know, you build, over, you build the trust up over, year, over years and years of working with them. I love it. So um, when you, as far as what you're into, I know we discussed the, that you, you uh, were influenced by Linnea. Um, I forget his name, but... Um, it's called Grant. I can never pr pronounce his second name. I think it's, it's A-C-A-T-H-Z. So Akchaz, I think, is the thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, know, I know the guy. Um, are you... Are you hair inspires hair type of guy or do you draw from from music and stuff like that like where where do you uh bring in things from oh uh, it's yeah definitely i think you've got to use your interests uh, outside of hairdressing to to influence your work uh, i think sometimes if you look too inside then it, it leads to uh replication rather than innovation i think and sure. uh so <clears throat> i would say that you know, it might sound funny to say, but I would say someone like Tar Quentin Tarantino has had more of an influence on my hair work than any hairdresser I could think about. It's great. It's great. Uh, Man just Manchester the, has had... Sorry, go ahead. Just because of the approach that, that he has with his films, that I take a lot of influence from that in my, my approach, and I think, I think that's... Uh, 
Yeah, that's 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 what I would say. Sorry, you were going to say something. Uh, I was going to say Manchester, where you grew up, has mm. has a pretty influential music history as yeah, well. Yeah. I was wondering, does mm. that play into your work at all? Um, a little bit, yeah. Because the, 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 I've done some work in the past where I might look at some references of like the, there's a musician Richard Ashcroft that comes from the same town that I come from in Wigan. And I've done a few haircuts based around his type of uh, hairstyles that he's got in the past. But cool. no, I've taken any direct influence from from that. Other than earlier this week, I did a live broadcast. Uh, oh no, last week, and it was I did like a, more of a bold type haircut that was quite prominent in like the '90s rave scene. Um, and you know, people like Sean Ryder from the Happy Mondays, he had that basically the same. His haircut was the same as Linda Evangelista's haircut in the John Michael video. Yeah, and yeah. One, uh, uh, a rave musician from a uh, council estate in Manchester and one's a supermodel in New York. But they had the same haircut for a time. That's fantastic. So, okay, that's great. Um, so you're at Trevor Sorby, and obviously you've moved over to Davinus uh, as their art director. Yes. Um, what was that like? What were, did you feel like you had kind of reached the end of your journey with Trevor Sorby already, or was this just kind of unexpected and you decided to take a plunge? Um, no, I didn't feel like I'd come to the end of my journey. I just felt like, you know, I was, what, the one thing I really loved about uh, working at Trevor's is like the authenticity and, and the, 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 the obsession that the company has and Trevor has with breaking new ground. It was always what's next, what's next, and and that's a lot of pressure, but that's uh, that that's what got him where he is, and that's what keeps the art team where they are. And I always thought if I was ever going to leave that, it would have to be to do something with for myself, like set my own thing up, because I don't think I would find that anywhere else. Um, and then when I started to speak to Davines and understand the company and understand what what Davide has built, uh, and started to to hear more about the direction that they wanted to go with the with the hair aesthetic and the photograph photography aesthetic, I was like, okay, this this isn't just a normal hair product company. This is a company that has a a social mission and and a a mission to to not you know not just to be the best in the world, but be the best for the world is one of the uh, mm. is one of the mantras. And, and as soon as I started to speak to them and started to to meet different people. And then found out a little bit more about the op the creative opportunities it would provide to you know to 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 produce huge shows on a on a big scale and produce huge collections on a big scale and and really for that to be my full time focus because at, at Trevor's I worked in the salon doing clients as well um, mm. but now I mean, this is my full time is my full time job is to develop new show concepts new photography concepts new education concepts which is is like a dream job for someone that likes the creative side of, of hairdressing, isn't it? So it was yeah. everything that I, uh, everything, if, it, if, I, if I could have wrote down a, an ideal scenario, then that, that's what developed with Davinus. So it's, uh, it's been since November, I started with them and it's, it's been great. Obviously, the, what's going on at the moment has uh, <laughs> ground everything to a halt, but I'm sure when we get back up and running again, it's, uh, yeah, it's gonna be cool. Yeah, yeah, super scary. Um, and you said things were amicable with Trevor Sorby. They're not treating you like you. you oh, no, no, cool, of... yeah. I was on the phone to Trevor about three days ago. Um, he called me up. He wants me to do something, uh, like edit some film for him. Um, Beautiful. But I speak to him a couple of times, you know, at least once a month. Um, we'll check in and see how he is. And uh, But, yeah, no, he, he, he gets it, you know, he's... He's seen it so many times before from obviously Angelo before me and Antoinette with the Vader and then Eugene Suleiman going being session stylist, mm -hmm. that Sally Brooks going and setting her own salon up and doing so well. So he, he understands that, that that's, that's why he attracts such good people because he, he doesn't hold people back. He puts them on a pedestal and he, he lets them, you know, when they're ready, go off and spread their wings and, and do things. Yeah, I think that that was hard to find for a time, but um, I think that's that's more common too. Um, that's really cool. Um, so, how would you describe 
where you're heading with Davinus? What, what are you guys looking to do? I want to, I want to do what I think is probably the biggest challenge in, in hairdressing at the moment, the biggest creative challenge, let's say, um, is I want to develop some work that people can actually take into the salon and use. Uh, and you know, because in years gone by, people would do that, right? It's like a hairdresser, uh, like a Trevor or a Vidal or someone would do, would develop a new haircut or a new hair style or color. And that would translate into the salon and then you'd see people walking down the street with it. But for years that has stopped. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm someone that I'll, I'll always want to do my more conceptual photography work because I really enjoy that and that's a personal project for me. But I, I want to I wanna develop work that people can go, that's new but I can actually translate it in the salon onto my client because I think there's no bigger creative challenge in hairdressing than developing looks that that will happen with. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, can, I can do more conceptual avant-garde haircuts all day long and I'll be very happy doing it. But th this is like a real challenge. That is a that is a tough one, especially as you lean more into the editorial side of things to have mm -hmm. things that are are wearable too. Um, yeah, that is a tough balance. The only thing I've seen and coming from Tony and Guy and appreciating it and looking at where where they've gone subsequently since the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, I always thought that they needed to to go back to go backwards into. Yeah. Um, their, their early collections seemed way more, um, what do you call it? Just classic in the sense that it wasn't going to be out of style for a very long time. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it's something that, that would stand the test of time. Yes, and that's, that's what you want, right? And that, that we just shot a collection um, for Davines called The Eternals, Portraits of People. <laughs> and that was the first step on this. Um, when I joined Davines, there was a great piece of writing um, done by a lady that works there, Maria Vittoria. Um, she's a mm -hmm. great director and, and she, it, there was a sentence in it that said, it's, this is the start of a long-term cultural project, which I really liked and it, and it, and it is. And this collection, um, the last one was shot all in natural sunlight. Um, no, uh, how can I say? No, no post editing at all to any of the colors, any of the shapes of the, the hair, no hair removed. It was all just as it was. So we want to be really authentic and honest with the photography and just doing work that, yeah, it, it, it's maybe, it's a little bit strong and it's a little bit conceptual, but it, there's always something that you can take from it to, to translate in the salon. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing going forward, creating portraits that look like people, look like real people and, and it's not, it's a, it's a photograph of a person, not a portrait of that's It's kind of like, when you take a photograph of someone, you want the person that's looking at it to feel like it's a person. It's not a model on a job. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, there's a big difference in that. And that, that's the direction that we're going to be going with. That, that sounds great. So yeah. do, are you guys shooting everything? They're based in Parma, right? In Italy? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful village in Parma, yeah. So are you are you going there to do all of the conceptualizing and shoots and stuff? Uh, no, so I, we shot the last one in London, um, but I uh, I would be open to because the light there is amazing, and if we're going down this natural sunlight avenue, and I don't know if we, I, I've not I've not really decided if we are yet, but. If, if, if this is something that we're going to do, there's no, you know, the light in Italy, at that, that area, that, as it, you know, coming up in the sunlight in the morning is just beautiful. So maybe, I don't know. <laughs> it's easier to shoot in London from a model point of view um, right. because I can read past the girls here and um, it, it's, it's easier than that. So, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think the great thing about, about Davines is that they're not, they're not interested in what they know. They seem to be interested in what they don't know and what's next and <clears throat> moving forward. Uh, and that's, that suits me down to the ground. So I don't, I feel like with the photography work, nothing's off the table really. So the last one was in London, but the, the next one could be wherever. I don't know. Yeah. It seems like, you know, culturally there's, you know, this shift 
worldwide to be more uh, about craft, you know, small batch things and, yeah, yeah. you know, handmade things and stuff like that. <coughs> and I think that's been a challenge um, for bigger companies to maintain that kind of, you know, connection with their audience or for their audience to feel like, oh, these are real people. This isn't this gigantic corporate cog that's just trying to calculate, you know, what yeah. we're into next. So I wonder that often how a company is able to be big, so to speak, but, um, but maintain that co connection with their audience and uh, mm -hmm. have it be something that people still feel like they want to be a part of. Yeah, and I think that's, that's, that's what, I think you're right, that's a huge challenge that a lot of big companies. I think with Davinus, and I've only been with them for, what, five months now, but it seems certainly it helps that it's owned by a family and not a big conglomerate of shareholders. So you, you sure. think there's more, the, the, that affords there to be more emotion and more authenticity and more, uh, uh, more, more realness and more heart in it. Rather than if it's you know if it's run by people that are literally looking at a spreadsheet to decide whether they've been successful or not, and I, and I think uh, sure. certainly in my short time with them that that I found that to be a massive benefit. Great, very cool. All right, and you guys, um, were you guys embarking on some sort of a tour right before this COVID stuff started happening, right? Yeah, so we 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 had a, a thing called the Worldwide Hair Tour that happens every eighteen months. Um, uh, the, the whole Davines community from around the world will get together. I think it's around 3,000 people. And um, <laughs> that was going to be in New York. Uh, it was going to be at the, the King's Theatre in Brooklyn. Um, but unfortunately, obviously, as, as with most things, that's, um, that's been uh, postponed uh, so indefinitely. So we'll, we'll see. I think when everything kicks back in again, I'm sure things will start getting rebooked. But at the moment, it's, it's how long's a piece of string, isn't it? You don't know. Yeah, absolutely. What was um, it? Was it going to be a surprise what the theme was, or what? What were you guys going with for this? Um, so I was at the moment still developing it. Uh, it was going to be in October, so I just started to to develop the the concepts. But I was going to I was going to shoot a collection and then launch a new collection there. Um, gotcha. But yeah, so we we will see. We'll do it. We'll do it one day when all this things sorted out. I visited the theater in Brooklyn. It's a beautiful theater. So. Yeah. What What was the theater again? Uh, the Kings. Oh, Kings Theater. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, man. Well, I hope you guys can get back on it. I hope everybody can get back on it to uh, mm. to to get everything going again. Because I'm really looking forward to seeing what, what you do with Davinus. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, of course, we're always here to, uh, to help out and to uh, uh, support you guys in whatever you're doing. Your site, and I speak to a lot of hairdressers that work in both the salon world and editorial and, and, and cross between the two, and uh, everyone speaks so highly of the way it's curated. I think you, awesome. you have a great eye for, um, I don't know, just picking work that, that speak. Every time I want to, I was speaking to a colleague earlier, and I told her I was doing this, and she said every time that she wants a bit of inspiration or just wants to see some cool hair, that's the first site she goes to. Uh, ah, that's that's great to hear. And with with all, with all the images that we're bombarded with on an hourly basis, to be able to cut through all them and find the 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 the, the ones that speak to the that come from the right place and speak to the most people, uh, like you do, I think is pretty good. Ah, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's it is definitely a labor of love, and I I just post what what I feel suits lost hairdressers. And uh, fortunately, it's been consistent enough to, to keep people engaged. Yeah, you can tell it's curated by someone that knows about her. Cool. Basically. Thank you so much. Um, we actually are, we've opened a, a space in Dallas where I'm from. Oh, yeah? And, uh, yeah. And so we're hoping for it to be uh, a nice hub in the center of the country Mm -hmm. uh, to have educators come in, um, mm -hmm. educators from all backgrounds, all product lines, all that stuff, uh, to to be a hub to accelerate. So we'd love um, when things get back to normal to have you out. And see what we can do. Yeah, I think yeah, that'd be great. Cool. What's the salon called? It's called Lost Hairdressers. Oh, Lost Hairdressers. Oh, wow. yeah. 
Yeah, it's a weird name for a salon, but we're going to no, make it work. <laughs> I, I like it, actually. So you're, you live in LA, but you have the salon in Dallas, and you go between the two? Yeah, yeah. All right, I, I right. was going, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. How, long is it, how long is the flight to Dallas? It's a, about three hours, two and a half, three hours. Okay, yeah. sure. Not too bad. My wife and I are both from there, so when we go back, it's, it's really easy. Yeah. yeah. But, cool. um, yeah, man, so hopefully things will get going. I know some people were curious about, creatively speaking, what you're doing to pass your time uh, mm -hmm. during this pause. If anything, maybe you're just concentrating on family. No, <clears throat> so I'm doing a couple of education lives um, each week. I'm on Davines Education Channel uh, Davines Education Facebook on okay. every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. UK time. Uh, and then I'm on Her Brain doing a live every Monday at 7 p.m. UK time. Uh, Very good. And then after that, I'm, I got some uh, photography friends of mine sent me a book called Silver Skate 70s um, by a photographer called Hugh Holland. Um, and okay. he basically, it's a coffee table book of um, all these teenage guys and girls in LA and San Francisco in the mid 70s when there was a drought on. So all the swimming pools had been drained and they were skateboarding in all the swimming pools. So nice. he went and so like a camera and there's these beautiful monochrome portraits in this coffee table book. But the hair in the book is unbelievable. Really? Okay. Yeah, they just had all these kind of like really heavy fringes, feather cuts, real bleach surfer type thing. and the, And all the pictures or most of the pictures are the guys in movement in flight so as they're coming up on the skateboard so the hair does these unbelievable shapes that if you can recreate there's, there's so i'm working on I'm, I'm working on creating a collection around this book that's uh, beautiful that's really that, cool yeah it's, uh, it's I, a nice book I, the skateboarding culture here in southern california obviously it was it was bred here but it's so thick there's so much to be drawn from that era, and it's it's this perfect balance of, of style and uh, edge and, like, the punk rock aspect, and, and everything just comes together so beautifully. I think it's it's something super reliable to draw inspiration from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, it's, it's uh, the, the, the hair in the book has blown me away. It's great. It looks like they've cut it themselves. It looks like you can see a hairdresser hasn't cut it, but it's super cool because of that, so... Tell me the name one more time. Silver Skate 70s. Silver Skate 70s. Awesome. I will yes. check it out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, man, um, we're looking forward to what you do next, and, and hopefully we can meet in person sometime soon. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Um, I appreciate you taking the time, and um, I think we covered any questions. Let me just make sure before yeah. I let you go. Um, you know, obviously a lot of questions about, you know, what what things have changed with COVID and where you see things going. Do you see anything big changing? Um, <clears throat> I think, I think definitely when people get back to the salons, I don't think it's going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of people that want a haircut, but I think there's going to be a lot of restrictions from governments into how close people can be in restaurants, in salons. So I think there's probably going to have to be a lot of uh, a lot of adaption into you know maybe you've got to remove every other chair in the salon to, to space yeah. things. Maybe you have to do staggered staff or, or things like that. But uh, yeah, I, th I think it's going to be more about around the logistics of getting people back into the salon. Um, yeah. I think people are up and running again. I feel like because of all the lives and all the education and all the online stuff, maybe you might find that people. Uh, I don't know. It might go one of two ways. People will think, oh, well, we can just watch education on uh, online so we don't need to go to a her show or a seminar. Or maybe we'll be really craving that shared experience of being in a room and watching someone on stage. And uh, I don't know which way that will go. It could go one of the two ways. When you're doing these live sessions on Hairbrained, are you using a mannequin? I'm assuming so. Yeah. 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 Do you feel like it's anything's lost there, or, or do you feel like it's a pretty yeah. good way to, yeah? Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely lost, because it doesn't have the, uh, as I was saying earlier, that such a huge part of when I decide what haircut or what style or what color, 
is about the person and the uh, personality or his personality and their character. So obviously that's lost. Um, so you almost have to invent a character on, on this mannequin. So, so that's a, a little bit, that, that's lost. But from a technique wise, then, then yeah, you can, you can still educate a, a technique. I think. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Tom, um, we'll just end it there. Thank you again so much for, for, uh, for being a part of this and keep us posted on what you uh, do in the future. Yeah, we'll do. Good luck. All right. Good luck. Thanks, man. Well, Have a good one. Stay safe. You too. Take care. Bye. Take care.